After his father, King Philip II, was assassinated in 336 BC, Alexander became Macedonian king at just 20 years old. Despite his young age, he led armies fearlessly into battle time and time again. With his superior planning, tactics, and intelligence, he became one of the most successful military leaders in history, sporting an undefeated track record. While his conquest lasted nearly 12 years, one of his most stunning victories was also one of his earliest. The conquering of the Achaemenid Empire, also known as the First Persian Empire, ruled by Darius III, the the Persian Empire was the largest empire that had existed in history up to that point, but it fell to Alexander the Great in a series of decisive battles, mainly at Granicus, Issus, and Guagamela. Alexander's conquests was long and complex, but today we're going to dive into the crucial moments that allowed Alexander to be able to defeat such a mighty empire that had ruled Western Asia for over two centuries. So why was Persia Alexander's first target, and how could Macedonia hope to compete with such a vast empire? To understand this, we need to understand the region's history from before Alexander was even born. In short, from about 499 BC to 450 BC, there was a series of battles collectively known as the Greco-Persian Wars, in which the Persian Empire launched repeated attacks in an attempt to conquer Greece. Greece at this point in history was not a single country, but rather a region comprised of several city-states. Ultimately, these city-states, primarily led by Athens and Sparta, formed an alliance and were able to defend against the invading Persian forces, securing peace in the region. Fast forward a hundred years, and these city-states were at war, but not with the Persians, but rather with each other. Macedonia, under the rule of Alexander's father, King Philip II, had become the dominant kingdom in the area, with the largest army and the most resources and land. Many of the other city-states, mainly Athens and Thebes, saw Philip's power as a looming threat to their own independence and so they declared war on Macedonia and whatever city-states would side with them. This culminated in the Battle of Chaeronea, where in a single battle, Macedonia and its allies defeated Athens and Thebes in what many historians consider the most decisive victory in history. The armies of Athens and Thebes were annihilated and could no longer war against Philip's Macedonia. As a result of this victory, every Greek city-state, with the exception of Sparta, entered an alliance with each other known as the League of Corinth or the Hellenic League. This new alliance voted Philip with his missing eye as the military leader for an upcoming campaign against the Persian Empire, a war which would avenge their forefathers, liberate multiple allied city-states that remained under Persian occupation, and ensure that Persia would never again be a threat. But before these plans came to fruition, in 336 BC, Philip was suddenly assassinated, leaving his son Alexander as the king of Macedonia and the military general of the alliance that was preparing to march against the mighty Persian Empire. Persia, who was normally seen as a symbol of stability and prosperity, was in somewhat of a vulnerable state. The Persian king, Artaxerxes III, had been recently murdered, leaving the throne to Darius III. Egypt had revolted against Persian occupation, and the Persian fleet wasn't nearby. If there was ever a chance for Alexander to strike, this was it. The first encounter between Alexander's army and the Persians occurred at the river Granicus in May 334 BC. Today, this river is called the Bigger River, and it's located in northwestern Turkey. As Alexander approached from the west, the Persians were waiting on the eastern bank, meaning that the Greeks would have to cross the river and its muddy banks to fight. Historians' estimates of the sizes of the armies vary wildly, from 20,000 to over 600,000, but a general consensus is that both sides had between 30 and 40,000 men, as this lines up with the numbers in the following battles. But keep in mind that this is just an estimate. What is known for sure is that Persia had several thousand more heavy cavalry than Macedonia, and also had hired Greek mercenaries who were familiar with Macedonian tactics. The Persian cavalry was placed in front of the army, waiting to charge any infantry that would attempt to cross the river, while its archers and light infantry were stationed behind them, surely a formidable sight to the approaching Macedonians. Despite marching all day to reach the river, Alexander decided that camping for the night was not his style, and he ordered an immediate crossing of the Granicus River in order to attack. The Persian king Darius III was not present at the fight, likely because he underestimated the threat of the Macedonian army, and instead sent his satraps, or nobles, to deal with it, along with a Greek mercenary named Memnon of Rhodes. But Alexander, in his flashiest armor and decorated helmet, would never give up a chance to lead his army headfirst into battle. The Greek cavalry 
split into two groups on the sides, with Alexander leading the right flank and his right-hand man, Parmenion, leading the left flank. This battle began when the Macedonian heavy infantry in a phalanx formation began crossing the river in the center and immediately became a target for the Persian archers on the other side. As thousands of arrows and thrown spears struck the Macedonian phalanx, the cavalry on either side charged across the river. Parmenion and his cavalry crossed the river and moved straight forward, engaging the Persian cavalry that had been positioned to intercept them. Alexander, on the other hand, ignored the cavalry that was directly in front of him and led his own force directly into the Persian center, causing the archers to flee and giving his infantry the chance to make their way across the river. As the Persian cavalry realized what was happening, they circled around Alexander's force, resulting in some of the most intense fighting of the entire battle. Despite being nearly surrounded on the Persian half of the river, Alexander's cavalry was immovable. The Macedonian cavalry were expert wielders of Zystons, long, fierce weapon that had often two pointed ends. This gave them an advantage against the shorter Persian javelins. Alexander himself fought fiercely, and when his spear snapped in half without skipping a beat, he took another spear from one of his generals and continued his attack. He then spotted Mithridates, a Persian noble and cavalry leader. Alexander charged him, and after a brief clash, emerged victorious after thrusting his spear into Mithridates' face. But this ballsy charge left Alexander exposed, and another Persian noble, Rasaces, charged Alexander from behind, striking his helmet with his sword. Alexander's helmet had been punctured and his head was bleeding, but he turned and killed Rasaces nonetheless. And as a third noble, Spithridates swung his sword at Alexander. His arm was cut off by one of Alexander's bodyguards, Cletus the Black. The Persian center had been broken, and the Macedonian infantry was now arriving steadily from the Granicus River, marching forward in tight phalanxes. The Persian armies began to flee, and Alexander's men didn't chase them for long, focusing instead on the Greek mercenaries that had been fighting for the enemies. Parmenian's cavalry from the left flank circled behind them, resulting in the absolute defeat of the mercenaries, with thousands killed and thousands more taken prisoner. In the end, this was a massive victory for Alexander. Most sources say that as little as 150 Greek soldiers were killed, with about 1,000 injured. On the Persian side, it's possible that up to 2,000 cavalrymen had been lost, along with 3,000 of their mercenaries killed and another 2,000 taken prisoner. The Battle of Granicus had showed Alexander's men that they could rely on him in battle. After all, he took a sword to the head, and some sources say that he even fell unconscious during a portion of the fight as a result. But crucially, after the battle was won, the Macedonians looted the abandoned Persian camp, sending home much of the spoils and giving much-needed financial support to the campaign. After the Persian defeat at Granicus, King Darius III realized that he had underestimated the Macedonian army and that it was now a potential threat to his entire empire. To put an end to the invasion, Darius began amassing an army to confront Alexander himself. With the initial Persian resistance out of the way, Alexander's army moved essentially uncontested through Western Asia Minor, liberating cities that welcomed him and besieging those that resisted. Another important Macedonian objective was to capture as many Persian port cities as possible. This way, the Persian fleet would be unable to land reinforcements to support Darius. The Persian fleet was massive, and the Macedonian fleet could never compete with it directly. After capturing important coastal cities such as Ephesus, Halicarnassus, and Miletus, the Persian navy had nowhere to safely land reinforcements behind the Macedonians, and to ensure this, Parmenion was sent with a large force to occupy the area around the town of Issus. It was also during this period that Alexander captured the city of Gordian, the location of the not-so-large complex that local legend stated that the man who could untie it was destined to rule Asia. After inspecting the not Alexander drew his sword and simply sliced it open. As he continued through Asia Minor, Alexander was aware that Darius was to the east and Babylon assembling his army. But in autumn of 333 BC, Alexander's scouts informed him that King Darius was marching closer. Alexander gathered his forces and marched south of the town Issus into a narrow mountain pass where he rejoined forces with General Parmenion. His hopes were that Darius would take the quickest route to him, which would lead the Persians to the south through the Bellum Pass, to the west of which the Macedonians would be waiting to ambush them. Darius, possibly anticipating this, moved his army to the north, taking the longer route around the Amanus Mountains, today known as the Nur Mountains, located in south-central Turkey. This allowed Darius to take a wide flank behind Alexander's army, and he captured the now defenseless city of Issus, where the Macedonians, sick and battle-wounded, were resting. Darius had them all killed 
Leopold and began marching southbound behind Alexander, which cut off the Macedonian supply lines. This forced Alexander's hand in the matter, and he immediately marched northward for battle. The two armies caught sight of each other on November 5, 333 BC, south of the town of Issus, at a small river known as Panarus. This time, Darius had used his empire's vast resources to amass an army much larger than Alexander's. Both sources say that the Macedonian army was about 40,000 men, while the Persian army was likely more than double this size. The Persians had again brought hired Greek mercenaries with them, cavalry, and all 10,000 Persian immortals, elite heavy infantry units. Darius wants to fight Alexander in an open field where the advantage of his immense numbers would be felt, but the Gulf of Issus, where the battle soon was to take place, was only a couple of kilometers wide between the sea and the mountains, meaning he couldn't take full advantage of the size of his army. Darius was also a bit surprised to find the full force of Macedonia there, as he was unaware that Alexander had beaten him to Parmenian, and Darius had hoped to face each of their forces individually while they were still separated. Alexander stationed his troops just as he had at the Battle of Granicus. Cavalry on the left, led by Parmenian, phalanx in the center, and Alexander with his elite companion cavalry on the right. This time, though, Darius threw the first punch. His cavalry, positioned near the beaches on Alexander's left, charged across the small river, hoping to overwhelm Parmenian's cavalry. In response, the Macedonian phalanx began its attempt to cross the river, their formation once again relentlessly struck by thousands of Persian archers. Initially, the tide was shifting in favor of Persia. Parmenian's cavalry on the left was heavily outnumbered, and the center phalanx was slowly coming undone due to the sheer number of enemies pushing it. But Alexander and his companion cavalry managed to charge across the river on the right near the mountains and crushed the infantry that resisted them, breaking a hole in the Persian defensive line. He made a quick decision to flank behind the enemy lines to aid his phalanx. Now under attack from three sides, the Persian center quickly began to crumble, and the Macedonian phalanx moved like a machine through the enemy lines, their long spears making quick work of anyone who got too close. Darius realized the danger he was in, and like a scared hamster, turned around and ran. Alexander and many of his troops stormed after him, but were unable to catch the king himself. The Persian cavalry, despite its initial success against Parmenian, also turned and fled, suffering heavy losses as they attempted to escape the battle, saved only perhaps by the Macedonians stopping the chase as the sun fell below the horizon. The Battle of Issus was another devastating loss for Persia. Darius had lost at least 20,000 soldiers, while under a thousand Macedonians had been killed in battle, with between five and 7,000 wounded. Alexander had shown that discipline and training could defeat sheer numbers, but Darius was still alive and already preparing for a rematch, and he wouldn't make the same mistakes twice. For the next couple of years, Darius retreated to Babylon deep in his empire to decide how to handle the invasion, and Alexander continued his conquest of Persian territories. First, he besieged Tyre, and then successfully attacked Gaza. When he arrived in Egypt, he didn't have to fight. They were more than happy to be liberated from Persian occupation. As Alexander continued to snatch one city after another, Darius tried his luck with a more diplomatic approach, and drafted three separate treaties which were presented to the Macedonians, each more generous than the previous, but all three of these were rejected by Alexander, even though the last one included allowing Alexander to co-rule the empire, as well as offering one of Darius's own daughters to be his wife. Desperate times call cool for desperate measures, it seems. As the Macedonian army moved eastward, Darius assumed that Alexander would advance to the southeast along the banks of the Euphrates to Babylon. To counter this, Darius employed a tactic known as scorched earth, where he burned and plundered the land ahead of time, leaving no food or supplies behind for an invading army moving through the area. This strategy had been suggested to Darius years earlier, when Alexander first entered their kingdom, but Darius had ignored it until now. Alexander, instead of heading southeast along the Euphrates as Darius expected, headed northward, opting to cross the Tigris River first, looting rural villages as he went instead of heavily defended cities. Darius sent an advance party, led by noble Mazius, to burn and plunder the eastern banks of the Tigris before Alexander crossed, but he failed to get there in time to prevent the crossing. By the lunar eclipse on October 1, 331 BC, both armies were now on the eastern side of the Tigris. Darius looked for an optimal place to wait for Alexander and chose a wide, flat plain near the village of Gorgamila, not wishing to be caught in the same geographical trap that he had been lured into two years before. Alexander was initially unaware of the Persian army's location, but his soldiers managed to capture some of Darius's scouts and learned that the enemy was just to the east of them. Alexander immediately marched in their direction. As he approached, they were spotted by a small Persian 
Division 4 Sonic Hill next to the open fields. This smaller group, led by Mazius, understandably didn't want to fight the entire Macedonian army, so they simply retreated back to the main camps, giving Alexander the high ground. But Darius was confident in his positioning, as the open field below the hill was well suited to the number of soldiers he had with him. Most sources placed the Persian army at over 100,000 men. Darius had once again brought his 10,000 immortals, tens of thousands of infantry, plenty of cavalry, and this time even brought 15 Indian war elephants and several bladed chariots. The Macedonian force, on the other hand, was about 47,000 strong. From his vantage point on the hill, Alexander could see the entire Persian formation and every enemy movement. He knew Darius wouldn't dare risk attacking his well-defended hill, so Alexander took his time ensuring that his soldiers were well rested, fed, and prepared for war the next day. Conversely, Darius was under constant threat of sudden Macedonian charge, and his soldiers had to be ready for battle at a moment's notice, even throughout the night leading up to the battle. As the sun crested the horizon the next morning, Alexander's men marched down the hill and positioned themselves for combat. Without going into too much depth, the Macedonian formation was once again a line with a phalanx center and cavalry on each side. But this time, the sides curved backward slightly to avoid being surrounded by an enemy flank maneuver. Alexander once again took his companion cavalry on the right edge and trusted the left side once again with Parmenian. As Alexander moved to attempt a wide charge on the right, the Persian cavalry charged his position, but the elite companion cavalry held their ground, pushing the Persians back. Darius then commanded his chariots to speed into the Macedonian phalanx. The Macedonians had trained for such a threat, and they responded by breaking formation and allowing the chariots to enter their lines, after which they quickly surrounded them, making quick work of the chariots with their three-meter pikes as they rode through. With the chariots out of the fight rather quickly, Darius ordered his remaining cavalry to attack the Macedonian left flank where Parmenian was stationed. Though heavily outnumbered, Parmenian's cavalry was able to hold the line for quite some time. With the entirety of the Macedonian cavalry occupied on both flanks, Darius seized an opportunity to strike the formation's weak center. As his immortals charged towards the Macedonian phalanxes, it seems as if Darius had the upper hand, but this was a trap. Alexander had anticipated this move. When the front line of Persian infantry reached the Macedonian line, Alexander's cavalry, triumphant on their right flank, immediately charged toward the Persian center, right to Darius and his royal bodyguards who were now left without their 10,000 immortals. The second line of Persian infantry stepped up, but despite numbering in the thousands, these units were poorly trained and equipped, especially in contrast to Alexander's elite cavalry. As Alexander slashed his way towards Darius, eager to take his crown, the Persian king started shaking in his boots and ran away for the second time. Alexander started to chase him, but quickly turned around and headed to aid Parmenian. The reigning Persian forces were quickly surrounded and destroyed. Alexander lost around a thousand soldiers at the Battle of Guagamela, but it's estimated that Persia lost more than 40,000. Alexander had humiliated Persia's army for the third time in just three years, and with this latest victory, he had gained control over the central regions of the empire, giving him the chance to attack Persepolis, the capital of the Persian Empire, which he successfully captured and burned. And while Alexander was disappointed that Darius had slipped through his fingers for the second time and was craving revenge, he wouldn't ever face him again in battle. Following the defeat, Darius once again attempted to amass an army, but struggled to gather a force of sufficient magnitude. This was partly because of his shrinking empire and the diminishing support from his own people, who were losing their confidence in his ability to tactically match Alexander. In fact, Alexander wasn't even receiving much resistance from some occupied Persian cities, as, among other liberal policies, he allowed them to continue practicing their own religion. Darius was eventually murdered by his relative, the noble Bessus. Bessus and the leader of the Persian palace guard bound Darius to an ox cart in the desert. As Alexander approached, they fled after wounding Darius and leaving him to die before the Macedonians reached him. Darius's killers were caught and executed shortly thereafter. Alexander was disappointed that he did not capture Darius alive, but he sent his body back to Persepolis, where it was given a grand funeral and buried in the royal Persian tombs. Alexander was now officially the king of the Persian Empire. Oh, and that daughter that Darius offered to him earlier? Well, he married her anyway. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, use that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.